Support for the Legislative Gazette comes from United University Professions, representing 37,000 academic and professional employees at SUNY campuses and teaching hospitals across New York State. Frederick E. Cole, President, UUPinfo.org. New York's rollout of legal cannabis has been plagued by numerous problems, including too many farmers licensed to grow marijuana and too few stores open to sell their products. The Legislative Gazette's Karen DeWitt reports. The adult use of recreational cannabis was legalized over two years ago. Since then, the industry in the state has progressed slowly. Just a handful of retail stores have opened to sell marijuana to date. As a result, around 200 farmers who were granted growing licenses in 2022 have been left stranded. They have crops that have been harvested but have few places to sell them. Jeff Jones, who has a state license to grow cannabis in the Finger Lakes region, is one of several farmers who expressed displeasure at a recent meeting of the state's Cannabis Control Board. I am profoundly disappointed in the current direction and deeds of the state of New York and the many entities represented in this room. Collectively, these agencies are not moving fast enough to create a viable marketplace for small businesses. Jeanette Miller, who runs the Eclectic Farmstead in Niagara County, is a founding member of the Cannabis Farmers Alliance. It's an advocacy group of 25 state-licensed cannabis growers. The group formed in response to what they say are confusing and contradictory state regulations and what growers believe is a lack of support from the State Office of Cannabis Management. Miller, who says she's an experienced hemp farmer and holds a master's degree, says she and the other state licensed growers are running small businesses that can't survive for long without the opportunity to sell their crops. The only legal cannabis was grown by us, and we need to find out how to you know, work with it to get it out to the consumers and then move forward so we can have the next batch going into the stores when they're ready because we have the legal cannabis. Everything else is illicit or medical. The growers also worry that they'll soon have to compete with cannabis grown by the state's medical marijuana industry. They are better funded and possess large indoor growing facilities. The Cannabis Control Board is creating regulations for the sale of those products, but it's not yet granted approval. Assembly Majority Leader Crystal People Stokes, who sponsored the original bill legalizing cannabis, was also at the meeting. She asked for tolerance, saying no other state has tried to set up a social equity program quite like New York's. We decided to take a method that was going to invest in the people who had the most impact mm. on, from the war on drugs. That's a challenge. You got to know, I've been in these places where I listen to people who don't look like me say there's no way black people can ever be in these businesses. We have to be the one to run it because we know how to do it. Well, guess what? We know how to do it, too. If you give us a chance, that's what this board is doing, giving us a chance. Now, I'm just going to ask people to be patient. The state has provisionally approved over 150 retail licenses, but only around 16 have so far actually opened dispensary stores. New York gave preference to applicants who were convicted of a marijuana-related charge during cannabis prohibition. They're also required to have successfully operated a business for at least two years. But the licensees have complained that the program, administered through the state's dormitory authority, has been slow to come through with the turnkey ready locations that they initially promised. The store locations were to be financed by a social equity fund run through the dormitory authority, but a firm contracted over a year ago to raise $150 million for the fund failed to follow through. A key figure involved in overseeing the social equity fund, Reuben McDaniel, resigned from the Cannabis Control Board in mid-June. As of the end of today's meeting, I am resigning from the Cannabis Control Board. McDaniels is keeping his job as CEO of the Dormitory Authority. Several days later, Governor Kathy Hochul announced in a press release that a new firm has been chosen, Chicago Atlantic. It's pledged to invest the $150 million. In Albany, I'm Karen DeWitt.
You are listening to the Legislative Gazette, a program about New York state government and politics. I'm David Gustina. Smoke from wildfires in Canada has blanketed parts of the Northeast in smoky skies in recent weeks. I spoke with New York State Assembly member Deborah Glick, who chairs the Environmental Conservation Committee. She cites climate change as a factor in the fires and says legislation to address it is a top priority. Well, you know, um, I think climate change is front and center. And uh, you mentioned the Bond Act, which has a wide range of resources going to different kinds of water quality, open space uh, acquisition uh, to preserve that open space, um, support for local communities to uh, upgrade their water systems so that uh, whether it's septic systems or whether it's removing lead pipe from uh, their service lines, uh, a wide range of things that need to be done in many communities across the state. Uh, and, you know, we experienced what California, Oregon, and Washington have been living with for three years at least. And um, we're fortunate that we have not seen the actual fires here, but it is something that the state is going to have to focus on in terms of protecting um, the land in the Adirondacks, the Catskills. And in small places, we had a fire in state, uh, in Minnewaska State Park that closed that park. Uh, and I don't recall whether that was a lightning strike or whether that was a carelessness of um, uh, somebody who was, uh, you know, uh, inappropriately setting a fire uh, to, you know, have a cookout or what. But those kinds of things, we have to uh, be more mindful and take uh, action to ensure that our forests are maintained. We have a lot of dying trees because of climate change, uh, certain trees, the hemlocks that are uh, being attacked by invasive species, um, are the, they anchor our water supplies around the Finger Lakes, around New York City reservoirs, and that is what keeps the soil um, on the banks and prevents sedimentation in our reservoirs and our lakes. Uh, we have a wide, we have a very serious um, situation on many fronts, and so the state is committed to uh, getting rid of fossil fuels as quickly as we can, increasing uh, our, the strength of our electric grid, uh, ensuring that we electrify more homes and that those homes are powered by uh, renewable energy and not by fossil fuels. Uh, that is a serious challenge. New York State is trying to meet that challenge as quickly as possible. But we have people who are opposed and raise every objection that they can think of uh, to slow our progress, and it cannot be allowed to happen. Um, and I'm proud that as the new chair of environmental conservation that we've taken steps, we've made it easier for geothermal boreholes to be made. They uh, are under a different permitting uh, process. Uh, if they go below 500 feet, they're treated as if they're an oil or gas well, when in fact they're simply um, putting down a pipe to create geothermal energy. Uh, and I'm proud that we've made what seems like a small change, but will make it easier and cheaper for people to use geothermal uh, energy. So uh, those are the kinds of things we have to reduce our dependency on uh, pesticides. Uh, we've passed a birds and bees bill. Uh, hopefully the governor will be signing that soon uh, to ensure that coated seeds that have been used prophylactically on corn, soybean, and wheat crops, uh, that that persistent neurotoxins uh, that migrate into the soil and into our waterways are no longer the automatic choice of farmers but is something that is used only for invasive species. Yeah, and then you have that green ammunition bill? Isn't that a proposal you put out? Uh, yes, lead-free lead ammunition. 
on state land. It only affects uh, hunting on state lands, and it is intended to uh, reduce the um, lead poisoning in scavengers and in the meat that is donated to uh, food pantries around the state. Uh, I don't understand the opposition to that. Uh, we know that lead fragments and its microscopic pieces could be poisoning uh, anybody who's eating that meat and certainly has had a devastating impact on raptors. So, uh, And it's only state land, which is 15% of the state. People are still permitted to poison their own lands. That's New York State Assembly member and chair of the Environmental Conservation Committee, Deborah Gleck. You are listening to the Legislative Gazette, a program about New York State government and politics. I'm David Gustina. U.S. Interior Secretary Deb Holland visited the University at Albany this week to discuss offshore wind energy and how it ties into President Joe Biden's agenda. The Legislative Gazette's Dave Lucas was there and filed this report. In town to speak with elected officials and local leaders, Holland said investments from President Biden's Investing in America agenda will support the offshore wind energy industry and lead to job growth. This morning, we toured the Port of Albany, where we saw the progress being made on the construction of the offshore wind expansion project and learned more about collaborative efforts between the Port of Albany, its contractors and developers, and the New York State Energy Research Development Authority to advance the offshore wind supply chain and create jobs through community revitalization in a clean energy economy. We also received a briefing from Port and... NYSERDA leadership on how the ongoing work across the area will strengthen the economy, environment, and energy future in Albany and communities across the state. This collaborative effort is a centerpiece of President Biden's Investing in America agenda, including the administration's goal to deploy 30 gigawatts of offshore wind energy capacity by 2030. This creates good-paying jobs, promotes equity and inclusion, bolsters energy security, all while contributing to New York's ambitious goal of 9 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2035. In January 2021, officials celebrated the selection of the Port of Albany as the first offshore wind tower manufacturing site in the United States. A $357 million project to manufacture 150 offshore wind towers annually. Expectations include hundreds of new green energy jobs. Democratic Congressman Paul Tonko of the 20th District says Capital Region wind projects at the ports of Albany and Queemans will reap some $14 billion in investments. Offshore wind with the opportunities for the towers, the foundations, the fins to be manufactured with skilled labor that we have here, with ports that are equipped and ready to go, with plant modernization monies that are part of the infrastructure bill, that having together put together not only the resources Resources in the Inflation Reduction Act, but the policy language, which provides certainty and predictability for investment tax credits and production tax credits. This is part of a masterful plan that will make certain that we move forward and move forward with a sound technological background and foundation that will enable us to incorporate these changes in a way that will provide for a better outcome, a better world. And so as we look at the entire East Coast, that we can serve. I see us as an epicenter of offshore wind uh, opportunity. The project has dealt with pandemic-related supply chain issues, inflation, and rising construction costs. In February, it was reported developers were $300 million short of the money needed to build the factory. Port Chief Executive Rich Hendrick tells WAMC that figure holds today. Well, the... uh The project is moving ahead. Uh, You know, we do have a realistic funding gap. Uh, We're looking at uh, managing that in uh, 
in uh, different ways, uh, but the project uh, as it is, uh, the secretary and uh, the congressman were here today, and uh, they've seen the, the work that's going on. Uh, they've seen the uh, the improvements that have been made uh, since February, uh, and uh, we're you know we realistically. Uh, uh, we're not getting around. There is a funding gap. Hendricks says there's a long road ahead before the first finished wind tower heads down the river towards South Brooklyn. Hendricks says the project deadline is floating and welcomes the recognition the port is getting from the administration. Secretary Holland was due to be in Vermont Friday for a similar visit with state and local officials. For the Legislative Gazette, I'm Dave Lucas. The growing popularity of the Adirondacks has prompted several studies into what is called visitor use management planning. The latest release this week by the Adirondack Council finds that high use is not only affecting the wilderness, it's diminishing hiker solitude. The Legislative Gazette's Pat Bradley with more. The Council commissioned a report in 2021 from OTAC, an Oregon-based company that does research in sustainability and diversity in a number of areas, including the environment. The New York State Department of Environmental Conservation has also contracted with the company to develop a visitor use management plan. Adirondack Council Conservation Director Jackie Bowen says theirs is separate from the DEC and is different from other studies assessing park overuse. There's been different ones that have looked up at the Paul Smith area in terms of recreation management and ski touring. This one really focuses on the High Peaks Wilderness area and takes rigorous science and data collection that happened over the course of two months and puts that into the quiver of knowledge that's needed to manage the high peaks area and to manage public lands within the park right it's, it's really meant it augments the amount of information that is available to do more appropriate management of those public lands the state DEC awarded a visitor use management planning contract to OTAC in March. Bowen says the Adirondack Council's report from the company will be shared with the state agency. Meanwhile, a unique aspect of the council's report looks at hiker solitude. So we wanted that included because the state land master plan for Adirondack Park dictates that solitude is an important aspect of wilderness. And so getting at what does solitude really mean and how can it be useful for land managers? And I would say every seven minutes, that's pretty frequent if you're a hiker and you're looking for a wilderness experience. But in terms of figuring out how much is too much, that really comes down to the land managers and additional data that needs to happen and setting those thresholds as a part of the VOMF process. Protect the Adirondacks Executive Director Peter Bauer says there haven't been a lot of high-quality studies on visitor use management for the Adirondacks. As far as forward, long-term planning for how to manage public use on the Forest Preserve, where it's most appropriate, what are the levels of people that we want to see, what are the experiences that we want people to have on the Forest Preserve, what is the capacity of the natural resources to withstand different levels of use? What types of trails do we need to facilitate that type of use? We've done it in a very fragmented way over the years at a very baseline rudimentary level, forest preserve unit by forest preserve unit. So this is an opportunity to bring some highly trained outside perspective of a consultancy firm that has done a number of these studies around the country. Visitor use management plans are in use at national parks, and Bowen expects a modified version to be applied to the Adirondack Park. The brilliance of the visitor use management framework is the fact that it is meant to be adapted to the place and the, the landscape at which it is being used. So even though it's a federal framework, I think that we are still going to land with a really adaptive and tailored management approach based on what we're seeing here in the Adirondacks, despite it being a federal framework. And so I think that through the study that we commissioned and then the DEC's process and the partnership with OTAC moving forward really starts to set the foundation for this visitor use management planning process being adopted at a much wider scale across Adirondack Park. The state has contracted with OTAC through 2024, and Bowen hopes within three years an Adirondack Park visitor use management plan will be implemented. For the Legislative Gazette, I'm Pat Bradley.
listening to the Legislative Gazette, a program about New York state government and politics. I'm David Gustina. An organization responsible for identifying $5.7 billion worth of tax fraud in 2022 is one of the lesser-known federal law enforcement agencies. The Internal Revenue Service's Criminal Investigation Division has more than 2,000 special agents and roughly 1,000 professional staff, making it the sixth-largest federal law enforcement agency in the U.S., It's the only one authorized to investigate federal criminal tax violations. The New York field office, responsible for the entire state, is led by special agent in charge Tom Federuso. Capital Region native spoke with the Legislative Gazette's Jim Lavoulis this week about his agency's work and his path to the job. It was a long journey to get here. I've been in the role uh, for two years now. The first year I was in an acting capacity. Uh, It took about a year to get certified into the uh, SES or the executive uh, division, right? Because that goes through, it's a federal process, you know, where you have to go through to get certified and there's interviews and so on and so forth and writing and, you know, the, there's a whole pro- procedure to, to become a, an executive in the federal government. Uh, once I cleared those hurdles, I became an executive around March of 2022. So I've been in the, the official SAC of New York uh, since 2022 in March. What's your professional background that led you to this this point in your career? I have a varied background. Uh, I'm a local product, so I was, uh, I was, although I was born downstate, I spent the majority of my life uh, in upstate New York uh, in Winnetskill. Uh, I went to LaSalle Institute for high school. I went to Hudson Valley. I received an associate's degree in criminal justice from Hudson Valley. And I went to the College of St. Rose to get my bachelor's degree in accounting. So I have an accounting background. Uh, I worked at Verizon uh, for several years, uh, right out of um, out of Hudson Valley. And when I received my bachelor's degree, I decided I wanted a master's degree also. So I went to the University of Notre Dame, received a master's degree in accounting. Uh, from there, I worked at KPMG in Albany for about four years. And I was fortunate enough to get a position as a special agent uh, with IRS criminal investigation in 2004 in Albany. So I worked in Albany for uh, for many years uh, as an agent. I became a supervisor in Albany. Uh, then I became an assistant special agent in charge for the entire field office, again, sitting in Albany. At that time, it was time to move on. Uh, I moved to Washington, D.C., uh, took over a program in Washington, D.C. It was our undercover program. So I ran the undercover program for the agency for about two years. I became the special agent in charge of the Philadelphia field office, after that, in 2020, and in 2021, as I said, I was fortunate enough to become the acting SAC in New York. Turning to the IRS CI, Criminal Investigation Unit, I- I'm sure this is a, a kind of an open-ended question in the sense, but what are the main functions of the IRS CI? CI's main function is to investigate potential criminal, investi- or criminal allegations of tax fraud, uh, but we also investigate uh, numerous other financial crimes. So what I tell people to, to make it the easiest, if it has to do with money, we follow the money and we investigate the crime. You mentioned a little bit of your background, that you have accounting experience, you have uh, private sector experience. Is that typical for your your coworkers in, in the IRS CI to have that financial background in addition to the, the law enforcement part that's necessary? Yes, we all have some financial background, whether it's uh, an accounting degree, which the vast majority of us have uh, a degree in accounting, or work experience in the financial investigation realm. Uh, Some we take right out of college, so they graduate and we pick them up as a special agent. We send them to the training academy for 27 weeks uh, at Fletzy in Glencoe, Georgia. And then they come back and they have an on-the-job instructor that works them through uh, getting them trained in the street and on the field. Uh, and then they become a full-fledged special agent. Uh, some people work, like myself. I've worked for a number of years before I became a special agent. Uh, and I had the, the background, the experience, and the education to go with it. So it, it varies from, from person to person. But we all get the same training when we go to the academy and we come out and we get the same field training. And, you know, it, it's, it's been successful so far. Looking through the, the notes on the IRS CI, uh, noted that it has an undercover unit. And I was wondering how that might look different than what most people might think of 
when they think of a law enforcement undercover unit in that the sense that you mentioned, you're looking at the cash, at the finances. Mm -hmm. That seems to me very, very ingrained undercover. Can you detail what that undercover unit might entail? I can, without giving up too much of our secret. I'd be happy to talk about it because I ran the program for two years out of headquarters, so I'm very familiar with it. I was an undercover agent myself, so I worked in an undercover capacity for a few years as an agent, and it's a very interesting uh, job. That's probably one of the jobs in federal law enforcement that's similar to what you may see uh, on TV or in the movies, right? It's not exact, right? You know, there has to be a story to tell, and it has to be interesting, but it's probably one of the closest things there is uh, to what you see. Uh, so as far as IRS criminal investigation undercover agents go, our specialty, again, is finance and money. So that's what we pose as. We pose as financers. We pose as uh, money people. We pose as uh, those who can take your cash and help you make it look legitimate, to wash it, to, and hence money laundering. So we help people to clean their cash. Uh, that helps us find out where the money's coming from where it's going to, and then we can lay out the organization, and then when it's time to go to the U.S. Attorney's Office and the Department of Justice to receive indictments, uh, we have a case put together. It's a solid case. Uh, we can get indictments and make arrests. That's the Legislative Gazette Jim Laboulis speaking with Special Agent in Charge of the New York Field Office for the Internal Revenue Service, Tom Paterusso. And that about does it for this week's show. The Legislative Gazette is a production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio. We had help from the New York State Public Radio Network. You can listen to the Legislative Gazette anytime at wamcpodcast.org or anywhere you get your podcasts. And be sure to join us again next week at this same time for more news on New York State government and politics. For the Legislative Gazette, I'm David Gustina.